This morning's scripture reading is out of Daniel chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If you are thrown into the blazing furnace, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of God you have set up. Good morning, everyone. You know, before we get started with this message, I just felt, you know, as we were singing that last song, It Is Well With My Soul, I couldn't help but think of the community down in Uvalde, Texas, and the, the, just the tragic shooting. And so I just, I just want to pray for that community um, before we jump in. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we cannot imagine what this community is going through, Lord. Lord, as we sit here and we sing, it is well with my soul. I can't help think about the troubled souls of so many, Lord. And so, Father, I pray that in a way that only you can, I pray that you would bring your peace, bring your comfort to this community, Lord in such a way that by the power of your Holy Spirit, they might be able to say, it is well with my soul. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, yes, good morning and welcome. Uh, any guests with us this morning, I want to extend a special welcome to you. Uh, my name is Jordan Higgins. Pastor Alex and his wife Kate are away on a little uh, weekend vacation, and so I have the opportunity to preach God's Word with you this morning. Um, we will be continuing through our series in the book of Daniel, and we're going to be in Daniel chapter 3, so please turn in your Bibles if you haven't already, and there's Bibles in the pew in front of you if you need one. Um, and in your bulletin, you'll find a note sheet. I didn't get the, uh, the, the fill-in-the-blanks done in time, but there is a place for your notes um, in case you'd like to follow along in that way. So a quick reminder, uh, the book of Daniel, right, it's set in Babylon as God has allowed Israel to uh, be exiled away from the promised land because of their unfaithfulness and their idolatry. And so the sort of broad theme of the series through Daniel is this idea of conviction over compromise, Right? And so we'll, we'll certainly see that as we work through our text this morning, as the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is certainly tested. So I'm, let's go ahead and jump in. I just had Perry read a few verses, but we're going to read through the entire uh, chapter 3 this morning. So I'm going to start reading in verse 1. It says, In King Nebuchadnezzar he made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now this, this first verse in chapter 3, it's highly ironic, right? Because if you remember back in chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream of a giant image, of a giant statue. And when Daniel interprets the dream, we found out that this statue represents this series of successive earthly kingdoms, with Babylon being the head of gold, and then, in the dream, a stone falls from heaven and smashes the statue in the pieces. And when this happens, um, and, and the stone that fell, that represents the eternal kingdom of God. 
And so when this happens, King Nebuchadnezzar bows down to Daniel and he says, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings. He's a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. And so, you know, you might think, okay, King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he gets it, right? He proclaims that this is God of gods, right? He, he's an exclusive worshiper of the one true God at this point. But here, right, three sentences later, in verse 1, he builds a 90-foot golden image that challenges God, right? It's a direct challenge to him. And so clearly there's something missing from King Nebuchadnezzar's worldview, right? His view of God. It's as if he's simply fitting God into his own framework, right? The dream, it didn't actually change his beliefs, even though he proclaimed that it did. He just found a way to fit God into his own category. And so he, this was just one more God to be worshipped for him, right? And ultimately, it seems like King Nebuchadnezzar King Nebuchadnezzar thinks that he is God, in a sense, right? He is king. He's in charge. And this, of course, right, it happens to us as well, that we will worship God on Sunday, but the, the rest of the week, we like to run our lives as if we are God of gods and Lord of kings, right? Or at least there might be certain aspects of our lives that we like to hold on to control of and think that, you know, we are the king of our little domains, Right? And so we'll hit on this theme a little bit more as we go on. Uh, but picking up in verse 2, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar, he sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. A lot of repetition in there, right? But here we have all the important officials of the kingdom coming for this dedication ceremony, right? All, all the leaders, they're here and they're ready. Verse 4 says, And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, and all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. <clears throat> and so the command to worship the golden image, right, extends to all peoples, all nations, all languages. And in pagan societies of that day, it wasn't uncommon to have multiple gods that one would worship. And so... You know, adding one more to the list to come and bow down to was not necessarily that big of a deal to them. But of course it was for the Jews, right? They were to worship Yahweh alone, the one true God. And of course, like we have the Ten Commandments, the first two commandments are all about this idea, right? Of worshiping God alone. But it's important for us to remember the greater context in terms of why the Jews were in Babylon in the first place, right? They were there because they worshipped idols. And so, you know, as future Israelites were reading these stories, they would be thinking about their forefathers' past sins of idolatry. And so at this point in the chapter, the question is, well, we know that there are certain Jews who are leaders in the kingdom, and so how are they going to respond to this command, Right? And so this is kind of the tension that's starting to build in the narrative. And, you know, we just want to point out this one thing that we saw, like this long list of government officials, all these instruments. And so why include all those? Why repeat them multiple times, right? And kind of the idea that is that this is just, it just shows the pomp and circumstance of this giant ceremony, right? All the officials were going to be there. All the nations were to come and bow down. All the instruments were playing, or every kind of music. This was just a big, grand ceremony for all to be at. And of course, if these people, if they don't fall down and worship, there would be 
severe consequences. And so based on verse 7, right, if we just kind of stop there, we think, okay, everyone, they bowed down, and so now we can just move on, right? But of course, that's not the end of the story. So picking up in verse 8, it says, Therefore, at the time, certain Chaldeans, which are just Babylonian officials, they came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever, right? And you can... You can almost hear like this pompous tone that they're giving, right? You, O king, you have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, why they should fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. But there are these certain Jews, O king, whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, why? They pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. <clears throat> and so, here we go, right? This is where the story really starts to pick up. Our, our three Jewish friends who we met back in chapter 1, right, they're not going to bow down to the golden image. And these guys, right, they have a certain lofty status within uh, Babylonian society within the government, and so it's likely that we have some jealousy that's at work here, right? And you may have noticed by now that the golden image is not actually described in detail. So, you know, was this an image of King Nebuchadnezzar? Was this an image of a god? We, we aren't actually told. But verse 12 gives us the most insight into at least the meaning of what this image was. And it, it seems to me that, that no matter what it was, right, the, the officials knew that they could manipulate the king by appealing to his pride regarding the statue. Right? They say, these men, they pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods, worship the golden image you have set up. Right? So in other words, they're, they're not giving you the loyalty that you deserve, O king. So based on sort of these comments and the, the overall pompous nature of this dedication ceremony, the primary issue at hand, right, it's not so much about the physical act of bowing, right? It was about, are you going to give your full allegiance to the king, right? And of course... <clears throat> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would not bow to the king. And, no, oh, I'm sorry. And so by, by pledging your allegiance to the king fully, you were saying, you weren't just aligning yourself um, with the king and who he was, but the overall greater Babylonian kingdom. So let's continue reading in verse 13. It says, then Nebuchadnezzar, in his furious rage, right? This is how, re how he's responding to the news that these guys aren't going to bow. In his furious rage, he commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, fall down and worship the image that I have made. And if you do this, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And what God, and who is the God, who will deliver you out of my hands? Right? And so the fact that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow down to the king, right? This enraged him. And so what does he do when they're brought before him, right? He starts monologuing. It's almost like the scene from a movie, right, where the even villain, he captures the heroes, and he's given them this last chance to come to the dark side. And what is the last thing that he says, right? He says, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands, 
So it's almost like this is sort of the foreshadow in the scene, right? We're, we're like, well, something is about to happen, right? This guy is challenging God. He thinks he's God. And so, of course, this can't end well. But what usually happens next in the movie, right? Somehow the hero gets away, and he takes down the bad guy by force, right? But notice how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego respond. Verse 16, our three guys, they answer, and they said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, he is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And so it's, it's almost like they're responding in this very matter-of-fact, almost like polite tone. Right? That's, that's at least how I kind of read that. They don't respond in anger. They don't respond in force. Right? They trusted their God to do their bidding. Right? It's almost as if God is the hero of this story. Right? And, and I think we especially need to heed this in a day that we live in a society that where it seems like everything is moving farther and farther away from God, right? But they respond with a complete trust that despite how dire their circumstances are, God remains in control. Not the king, not the political authority, right? Their God. And so that reality that God is in control, right? That informs how they respond in this moment. And of course, right, we love this example of the faith that is shown by these three guys, right? Oh, our, our God, he is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, right? We have full confidence in him. And of course, the crucial point, but even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't deliver us, we still are not going to bow. I think if we reflect on our personal faith very long, it's, it's fair to say this is a pretty convicting statement, right? Because you and I, we often, right, we want the guaranteed deliverance from the fire, right? Like, okay, God, if I'm really going to trust you, if I'm really going to give you everything... I'm going to need to see some results here, right? See, our faith is often condition-based. It's conditional based on the outcome that we want. We say, God, I'll trust you if, right? If you make my life better, if you give me what I want, if you heal me, if this, if that, right? And sometimes we can even hold on to what God calls us to do for a while, right? But if we don't get the results that we want in our timing, well, then we just move on. But do we see the irony here that what we are essentially doing is asking God to bow down to our golden images? See, we want to rule our own little kingdoms and make sure that God is on board with our plan. We tell God how we want our life to go and ask him to come through for us. And if he doesn't, well, we just dispose of him and we keep going, right? And we keep running, the, running things the way that we see fit. But the faith that we see here is not condition-based, but conviction-based. Conviction over compromise, our theme throughout uh, the book of Daniel. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right, if you think about these guys, they're all probably under the age of 18, or at least they were when they were brought to Babylon. But they were clearly ready for this moment. It, but just think how easy it would have been for them to bow, right? They're taken from their homeland. They're trained in the ways of Babylon, the ways of the culture for three years, right? They're encouraged to embrace the culture. Everyone around them is doing it. They're even given new names. Their identity is, is lost. So how easy would, would it have been for them to say, sorry God, 
but you're clearly not in charge, right? And we don't want to be burned alive, so we're not going to bow, right? And, and it's, it's just this one time. We'll just bow this one time, right? And everyone else is doing it. Things, they seem to be going fine for them, right? And how bad, how bad can it really be, right? And these, these are all excuses that we can tell ourselves. But of course, this is not what they did. And so Why? Why did they not bow? And I wrestled with this question, thinking, what was it that gave them this level of conviction? And so my first instinct was to say, well, they must have walked with God for a long time in a deep and personal way. And so their faith kind of grew up to a certain point where they could now be able to stand. And maybe they they had read the stories of Israel's history of God delivering, delivering them out of the powerful hands of Egypt, right? And so their faith was spurred on by this. And maybe this was a part of it, right? But then I remembered people in the Bible like Abraham, who God called to leave his land, to go into the land that God was calling him to go to. And based on what we have uh, in Genesis, Abraham immediately picked up and he went. He acted in faith right away. Right? And he hadn't encountered God previously. He didn't have time for his faith to grow deep in his personal relationship with God. And so I kind of came to the conclusion that the point of faith in this story and throughout the Bible is that it's not really about how much we have, but it's about who our faith is in. Right? Faith is not about how much we have, but who it's in. And in of course, in our walk with God, there's certainly an aspect of our faith growing over time, right? But his deliverance does not depend on the amount of faith, just that there is the existence of faith, right? Because the amount of faith that we have does not change the amount of power that God has to deliver, right? And what does Jesus say? He says, faith as small as a mustard seed, and you can move mountains. And why is that true? It's not, again, because of the strength of our faith, but because of who he is. And so, going back to our our text, how does King Nebuchadnezzar respond to this sort of polite defiance that these three guys offer up, right? How does he respond to the confidence in God that these guys show? So picking up on verse 19, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Benigo. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. Basically just saying it's turned up as hot as it can get, right? And he ordered some of his mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, their other garments, They were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace, because the king's order was urgent, and in the furnace, oh, I'm sorry, because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fell down into the burning, fiery furnace. And so here, right, the drama of the scene continues to heighten. The boys, they're thrown into the furnace seemingly to their death. But before we continue on, I just want us to notice one thing. That King Nebuchadnezzar, right, he was so infuriated that he doesn't seem to care that his own guards would die. Right? They're expendable to him. And this, of course, is what anger can do to anyone. Right? And especially if pride is already at work in our hearts. See, pride mixed with anger, it's not a good combination. It causes us to lash out and we don't seem to care about the collateral damage, right? So we could continue on uh, with that idea, but I just wanted to point it out um, quickly. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're thrown into the furnace. So what happens next? Let's turn to verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. 
he declared to his counselors, uh, Do we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, uh, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire. and They are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. And so somehow, right, this fiery furnace that had killed the guards by just getting close to it, right, it doesn't consume these three guys. And so why? Right, well, it seems to have something to do with this fourth figure who is like the son of the gods. And it's debated as to who exactly this divine figure is. Some think that uh, it's just an unidentified angel, and that's what Nebuchadnezzar uh, thinks it is, if we read down a little bit farther. Others think that this, is, that this could be Jesus pre-incarnate with the boys in the furnace. But whoever it is, the point is that divine presence was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the midst of the fiery furnace. In the midst of the furnace. And going back to this idea of wanting God to come through on our own terms, right? If this were us in this situation, we would have been wanted to be rescued before the fiery furnace, right? God, why did you allow things to get so hot? We, we might say, why didn't you come through sooner? But if the fire had not come, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not have experienced the protective presence of God. And we talked about this some on Wednesday at our men's relational discipleship group. I think it was Perry who said this, that what God wants is to take us through the fires with him not to completely remove the fire, right? And this, of course, seems counterintuitive to us. As the goal of our American life is to live comfortable, hassle-free lives, but this, of course, is not God's desire for us. Remember what James says. James chapter 1, verse 2, "'Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds.'" For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so why are we to see trials as joyful experiences? It's, it's often hard to... to that's hard, right? That's not, it's not our natural thing to do. But the reason we're supposed to is because they are forming us to become perfect and complete, Lacking in nothing, right? And so this is the vision that we are supposed to have for our lives, right? Perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, being formed into the image of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is what we are to attain to. <clears throat> so a quick illustration. Um, Ellen and I, we argue, right? Newsflash. Any other married couples in here? Any, any that argue? We have a lot of liars in the sanctuary this morning. Right? We all argue, right? And uh, so my natural inclination in these moments is to pull back and not really address the issue at hand. To just kind of say, well, let's just move on. She'll get over it. Right? And so why, why everyone, yeah, everyone knows, right? And why... Why do we do this? Why do I do that? Well, kind of reflecting on, on this, I realize that my idol in these moments is comfort. Right? 
And what happens when I bow, so to speak, to this idol? It, it is forming me into a certain kind of person. Right? Earlier I talked about how the golden image, it wasn't what it represents. It's more than just a physical act of bowing. Right? It was giving full allegiance to King Nebuchadnezzar and all that he stood for. And so our, our idols, they inform our allegiances. And what we give our allegiances to, they form us into certain kinds of people. And so if I fully align myself with the idol of comfort, it's going to form me into a certain kind of person, right? And you could replace any idol that, that we have, right? It's going to form us into a certain kind of person. And for this case, the type of person that allows issues to persist because I don't want to face them, and this, of course, harms my wife, it harms our relationship, it harms our family, right? Issues just simply continues to linger on. But what if, in those moments, I turned to God instead of comfort, right? And I said, God, help me face this. Help me through this. Help me go through it, right? Now, at first, this is it's not, it's going to feel more uncomfortable, Right? Things might get a little hot, right? It, and it, because it's not what comes natural. But we know that it pays off in the end to not bow to our idols, right? Our God is faithful. By turning to God and seeking his presence in the midst of our trials, again, we're being formed into certain kinds of people, people who are perfect and complete, lacking and nothing. And so we are to become people who are being formed into the image of God, not bowing to the image of a false God. And so clearly, right, this, this story, it's meant to cause us to evaluate our own faith, right? To look in our hearts, to see what idols we are bowing down to instead of God, right? We, we're all, we all need to reflect on that. But we're also meant to see the faithfulness of God and his ability to save. So I'm going to start reading uh, back in verse 26 to the end of the chapter, and then we'll look at the faithfulness of God. So verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar, he came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they came out from the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together. They saw the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servant, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they shall be torn limb from limb, and their house laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So remember the foreshadow back in verse 15, right? What does he say? He said, Who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Right? That's what King Nebuchadnezzar says. Of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're like, We know a God, right? We, we know a God who is able to deliver, right? They knew that their God was in charge, not King, Nebuch not King Nebuchadnezzar. And this is, of course, exactly what Yahweh does. He delivers them. I want us to notice some reversals that are going on here in these last few verses. See, at the beginning, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were accused of not bowing down and serving 
King Nebuchadnezzar and his gods. But now the king declares them to be servants of the Most High God, right? From serving King Nebuchadnezzar, being accused of that, to now the king himself is declaring them. And he is proclaiming that this is the Most High God. The story goes from cursing those who don't obey the king's command by throwing them into the fiery furnace. Goes from that to blessing the very ones who set his commands aside. Right? He's now honoring the very ones who defied him. <clears throat> and so now he makes a decree, right? And instead of all the peoples, nations, and languages bowing to this golden image, and if not bowing, being destroyed, now the peoples, nations, and languages, if they speak anything against God, they will be destroyed. And why, right? Why does he give this decree? He says, for because there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. And then one final kind of reversal is that the very thing King Nebuchadnezzar was trying to use to kill, right? Fire. What does fire represent all throughout the Bible? Right? Think about uh, the fiery furnace, the pillar of fire in the wilderness, the, the cloud of smoke on Mount Sinai. Fire in the Bible often represents God's presence. So a thing that King Nebuchadnezzar thought he was going to use to harm, God was using to manifest his presence. And so the point of all these reversals is that God is the one on the throne. Right? He is the one in control. And at this point, it's important for us to remember the original audience. Right? <clears throat> these, these people who were in exile because of Israel's faithful, faithlessness, because they did not obey God, because they bowed down to idols. Right? But what do they see? And the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They see that trusting in their faithful God will result in deliverance. Amen. And, and, and notice, notice some of the details of these last few verses. Right? The fire had not had any power over the bodies of these men. The hair on their heads weren't singed, right? Their clothes were not harmed. They didn't even smell like a fire. So I just love that the king thought he could kill them by fire, but he couldn't even make them smell like smoke, right? He couldn't even touch them because they were in God's hands. And so, church, it is, it is imperative for us to see the gospel in this story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Because Jesus, right, the Son of God... He came into this world. He came into this furnace of a world filled with sin, filled with death, filled with evil. He came in to rescue us. And of course, he did rescue us. Right? He went to the cross to die in our place, and he raised to life again. And by doing so, he defeated sin. He defeated evil. He defeated death. And when we place our faith in Jesus, the... <clears throat> And yeah, so, so when we place our faith in Jesus, the, the fires that we face, they can't ultimately harm us. Now, this doesn't mean that fires won't come, right? The trials, tribulations, they will come to everybody at some point. But his presence dwells with us in the midst of those trials. His Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of each one of us if our faith is is in Jesus. See, in Christ, nothing can harm us. And this reality, it should just give us an infinite amount of freedom and motivation to live our lives sold out for him. So I just want to read some verses that, show, that just show this reality of the fact that we are safe in Christ, that nothing, nothing can harm us. So Romans eight thirty eight, For I am sure that de neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord, this is Paul speaking, and he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Colossians 3, verse 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And finally, Matthew 10, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Excuse me. You see, we all, we all worship idols that we think are going to deliver us into the kind of life that we want to live, right? A life full of joy, full of meaning, full of love, full of fulfillment, full of purpose, right? No matter what the idol is, we think it's going to give us what we want, right? That's why we worship it. But we know that only God can truly deliver us, right? Only He can truly set us free. See, the one thing that King Nebuchadnezzar and God had in common is that they're both asking for our full allegiance, right? Both of them. But the difference is that what King Nebuchadnezzar has to offer is only a life of temporary non-death, right? Think about it. The only thing, it, the king says, if you bow, you won't die, right? That's it you bow, you won't die. That's all that they get. Meanwhile, God offers us eternal life in his presence. And we can all experience some of that life right now, right? Some of that that wholeness, that peace, that purpose, that abundant, spirit-filled life that only Jesus can give us. But why do we so often choose temporary non-death over eternal life with Jesus? I think the answer is because it's often not as hot, right? At least not not right now. It's often easier for us. Because who wouldn't choose a simple bow over a fiery furnace? It's what we naturally gravitate to, right? The easy, the comfortable. It gives us this immediate gratification that we all enjoy. And it feels great for a while, right? And maybe, maybe it even lasts for a lifetime. But it will not last for eternity, right? It can't. And the reality is, right, that, that temporary non-death, that's sort of putting rosy-colored glasses on it. Because in reality, a life apart from God, it leads to eternal death in a place called hell. That's, that's the truth. But may we be encouraged that for those who place their faith in Jesus, right, we serve a God who is able to rescue. Amen? And so may we prove to be faithful even in the fires, right? Even if trusting in God will bring about certain fires. But remember, our faith is in a faithful God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how great is the goodness that you have stored up for those who fear you. You lavish it on those who come to you for protection, blessing them before the watching world. You hide them in the shelter of your presence, safe from those who conspire against them. You shelter them in your presence, far from accusing tongue. Praise the Lord, for he has shown me the wonders of of his unfailing love. Father, you have shown us 
the wonders of your unfailing love. We see it all throughout Scripture. We see it most of all in your Son, Jesus, who you sent to this world, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so, Father, I pray that we would give our lives fully and completely to you. Knowing that whatever fires might come our way, knowing that whatever trials may come, that nothing can separate us from your love, Lord. That you protect us in such a way that we would not even smell like smoke, Lord. So may we have a vision of our life that says we want to be perfect and complete, made into, back fully into the image of Christ. And Lord, we know we can't do it in our own strength. We know that we need the power of your Holy Spirit in the midst of our lives in order for this to happen, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we serve a faithful God. I pray all this in your name. Amen. Let me just say that anyone who has not put their faith in Jesus but would like to, please come talk to me, talk to a trusted friend, talk to someone. We want to make sure you have that opportunity this morning. But with that, go know Jesus, make him known. You're dismissed.